Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Roar, the podcast. Uh, for those of you who have been following me for a while will know that I've recently rebranded to Roar, the podcast from Bullyproof. And it's really to broaden out the spectrum for us to talk really about any topics related to adversity, you know, any any stories that I would love to share with you around people who have experienced adversity in their life and have overcome that adversity and found their roar. And today is the second episode of Roar in its new format. Uh, last uh, couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Petra Velzebur. We talked about resilience and burnout and she came and she shared her beautiful roar. And today I'm delighted to welcome Dipti Tate, um, who I've recently met and um, who's who's changed my life forever. It's one of those angels that come into your life and then you just know that, you know, it's it's never going to be the same again. So welcome, Dipti. Oh, that's a lovely introduction. <laughs> I like being introduced as an angel. Thanks. Oh, I have so many angels and you now one of them. So let me tell you a little bit about Dipti. Um, Dipti is a, a born and bred London, Londoner who lives in the Cotswolds with her partner, Toby. She has two boys, age 18 and 19. She started her working life in television and radio and spent four years at the BBC. Dipti left the corporate world to dedicate her time to becoming a full-time mother. During her career break as a mother, tragedy hits and she nursed and lost both her parents to terminal cancer. From her experience of loss, she discovered the world of self-development, coaching and therapy and decided to dedicate the next phase of her life to mental health and well-being. Dipti is the author of Good Grief and Planet Grief, which will be out in October, so soon. Um, and she's a solution-focused hypnotherapist, grief and loss expert, and hypnosis lecturer. She's a relaxation ambassador and is known for her powerful demonstration in free flow trance. Dipti has had a few appearances on the breakfast TV sofa and as a guest on Good Morning Britain and the, this morning, as well as a regular guest on BBC Radio. Dipti is also an event speaker, lectures and teaches hypnotherapy and runs a busy global hypnotherapy practice, seeing on average 60 clients a month from her online practice in the Cotswolds. And I've recently had the pleasure of also um, having a hypnotherapy session with you, Dipti, which was absolutely wonderful. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Marilise. So I'm going to start us off because I'm really curious to l learn a little bit more about your story. Um, the whole premise of Roar is where we get vulnerable. We talk about the messy things and we really um, talk about it because in order to have the courage to speak our truth, which Roar is all about, we have to be vulnerable. So, so be vulnerable with us and tell us a little bit more about your story. So my story, I guess the most vulnerable feeling I've ever, ever felt in my life is literally losing my parents, you know, both of them one after the other to cancer and I'm an only child so I didn't have anyone to share or I thought I didn't have anyone to share that pain with and I felt very deeply alone and isolated at that time and I had no idea what grief was um, so I lost my dad I suppose I'll just tell you the story of how it happened. So, well, as as I was growing up, actually, I was used to my dad not being very well because he had a heart condition. He had his first heart attack when I was three. Um, I don't remember that. Um, but then every couple of years, since I was three years old, he had another one. He had about 12 heart attacks in wow. his life. So as I was growing up, I was really used to this happening. So 
in the middle of the night, you know, the, the, the blue lights would wake me up and, you know, my mum would be rushing me out of bed and saying, come on, we've got to go to the hospital. And I remember, you know, quite a lot of my, my childhood sitting in the back of the ambulance, watching the little beeping heart monitor going up and down and, you know, just thinking, you know, what does this mean? You know, I was only little and, um, his heart attacks were all quite severe ones as well. And, but the thing is, he always came back. He always came back out of hospital. So I kind of learned as a little child, okay, these big things happen. Everyone runs around, you know, everyone panics, but then actually it's all right in the end. It's okay. He comes back, you know? Mm. So I, I grew up thinking, well, you know, bad things happen, but then it's okay again. Everything's fine. So I kind of had this really interesting opinion about you know what other people would think of as hugely negative events I was like well it's not that bad you know so that's kind of how I grew up with that type of relationship with you know kind of looking at death almost and then it not happening if that makes sense because he'd always come back yeah so then when I worked at the BBC I was there uh, for a few years and one day uh, this is a long time ago before mobile phones. So when we had, uh, you know, a normal desk phone and it had a little dot matrix, um, you know, like panel. And um, one day it flashed up saying external call. And I knew this was bad because the only external person that would be calling me was the hospital. So... I knew my dad had gone in for a checkup, and I, uh, B the BBC is in White City where I was, and his hospital was Hammersmith, which was just about you know two miles away, around the corner. So this external call flashed up, and I was like, I don't know whether to answer this, you know, because I thought well, the hospital wouldn't be calling me unless they really needed to. So I thought, God, he's had another heart attack, you know. So anyway, I answered the phone and. The lady said, um, this is blah, blah, and uh, we would really love you to come in to the hospital. If that's okay, we know that you work quite near. Please could you come in, you know, whenever you can. We have something to tell you. And I was like, okay. And so I went over in my lunch hour and I went straight to the cardiac department, where the heart, you know, the heart department. Uh, no one, no, no. Mr. Paul, my dad isn't here. I said, well, he must be because somebody just called me to tell me to come in. No, no, he's not here. Oh, I don't understand. I'll go back down to reception and, and they will help you. So I went back down, you know, do we know where Mr. Paul is? You know, he called me and obviously we didn't have mobiles then, so I, I had no idea. I didn't even have the number of the person that called me. And they eventually tracked him down and they said, oh, yes, he's in oncology. So I was like, I have no idea what oncology means. I was 23 years old. I should have probably known what oncology meant, but we didn't have the internet then. <laughs> uh, so that's my excuse. Um, so I went to oncology and um, when I got there, I was like, hmm. This ward looks very cancer-like, you know, and I was like, why am I, why am I in a cancer place? and uh, found, found the consultant who asked me to come in. He sat me down. He said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but your dad has only got three months to live. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I laughed and I was like, are you sure you've got the right person? You know, and, and they said, he's got leukemia. And I was like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. He said, cancer of the blood. And I was like, no, he doesn't. He's got a heart condition. You've got it wrong, you know. And, you know, then he sat there and it's almost like all his words just turned into like slow motion. You know, I was not hearing anything. I was just sitting there like, I don't understand, you know. Anyway, so it just, time was warping out. It was just horrible. And, and then I said, well, can I see him? And they said, well, yeah, but he's not in a great, you know, state. He's, he's kind of, you know, he... and I didn't know whether he knew 
So when I went to sit with him, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know if he knew. And I, I, I it was just really, it was just so awkward. And then I was like, oh my God, I have to tell my mum. And so my mum didn't drive. And obviously, again, there's no mobile phone. So I called the house. There was nobody there. And there's no answering machine. So I, I didn't know what to do. Long and story short, you know, I basically went over there to hers in the evening he didn't come home he stayed there she was like where's dad you know he's supposed to be back by now and Mm -hmm. I had to tell her and then I brought her back to the hospital that was that you know they were right that was um that was May and he died in September wow so it was just I mean you know it was just the timing of it was horrendous and I, 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 my mum didn't, she was one of these people who was so reliant on my dad. Mm. You know, she couldn't even do simple tasks like a car, a machine, like um, cash out of a machine, you know, that type of thing. She was so reliant on him for every everything. Mm. So then, in, then when he died, what happened was our roles got reversed. Like I became her mum. She kind of effectively became the child. And so I was only 20, by then I was 24. So I turned 24 as he was, as he was dying. And that's the last thing you want to be doing as a 24 year old. You want to be going out, having a party and, you know, like just being free. And I suddenly just lost, I felt like all my childhood or adult, young adulthood had just crashed, disappeared from that very moment. Um, And then yeah that's kind of where my journey with grief started and continued because then my mum got liver cancer and then I had to nurse her as well and then as I was doing that I started writing my first book because that was the only way I could process my own feelings um the only way I could make sense of anything and that turned into a book it wasn't actually a book in the beginning it just turned it into a book afterwards but I wasn't writing it for out everyone else out there I was basically writing it for myself um but it seems to be helping people which is nice and then now you know a few years later well 10 years or so later I retrained as a hypnotherapist and grew my own business and it changed my direction in life because I was no longer a media London based lovey darling I literally had changed it was like my blueprint had changed you know what you talk about your blueprint it felt like I was given a blueprint but then that was taken away and then a new blueprint was put in you know and again in that period of time I had my children as well um and so yeah I see myself very differently now than I did then it's it's absolutely beautiful it's a beautiful story and it is amazing how you've just proven how um we we um, discover how strong we are in the toughest times in our lives you know that's where we have to really dig deep and have to really find the strength and the the, the 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 inner inner strength and the stamina really to to get up and and um, not only bounce back but bounce forwards and and I think I'm always I'm always I've always got this in my in my mind because people people talk about resilience as bouncing back but I'm like no you never just bounce back you actually evolve and you've just said that you've said how you've evolved and how things have changed um, over the many many years and every time you turn a corner there's a new surprise and there's a new you know a new level there's a new obstacle to overcome because obviously it's it's not something that's static we we have to work through these things we can't put them in boxes because they're always going to come back to haunt us so i'm curious um to to uh hear your sort of definition of grief um does it only relate to death or is it a more general term that you use so my introduction to grief was because of death. So that's where I found it first, if that makes sense, or it found me first yeah. through the death of my parents. But then I realized 
through the work that I do with grieving people and myself, that grief is not just linked to death and losing people. It's also related to anything that you've loved and lost. So how I felt it again come up for me was when I moved away from London, which is my home, was my home. I was born and brought up in London and I moved to the Cotswolds with my ex-husband at the time because he got a new job and the children were little. They were just about to go to school and we decided that maybe living in the Cotswolds would be better for them. Uh, you know, escape the big smoke and all of this, you know, bring the children up in the countryside. And, you know, on one level, that was a really, um, on paper, that looked like an amazing opportunity, such a good thing to do. Oh my God, but when I got here, it almost felt like I was grieving all over again. But now, this time, no one has died. What was I grieving? So I realized I was grieving London, but London hasn't died, it's still there. But London was my roots, London was my home, London was where I felt safe and centered and my identity was linked to London. Mm. And now living in the Cotswolds, it doesn't sound like a massive thing, but city and country living, huge poles apart, you know? Mm. I remember coming here and thinking, why does everything shut at five o'clock, you know? And what do you mean I can't just get what I want by picking up the phone whenever I want it? You know, what do you mean a taxi takes three days to come, you know? <laughs> and and a bus every four hours. And it was like, what kind of place is this? And then at night, it goes really dark, you know? And there are no street lamps and... When you ask for directions, people say, oh, you know, the first hill with the, with the, with that, you know, the graveyard and you're like, what's the name of the street? And they're like, what, what street? And it just, I, you know, just so many things. I was just like, what kind of place is this? And then the, you know, I felt there was no culture here. And obviously it's a very white middle class place I've moved into I had to get used to that because obviously the, the multicultural aspect wasn't here mm. uh, the cosmopolitan vibe was not here and I just felt stripped of everything I know again grief came to get me hugely mm. but I didn't understand why I was grieving or why I was feeling that sense of desperation and loss of identity, loss of purpose again, because I thought I'd got over it, you know? Yeah. So then I realized that grief comes in many, many forms and it's not linked to death only. It's linked to a loss of anything you've loved. It could be a loss of a business, loss of identity, loss of purpose, mm. loss of who you think you are, loss of what you think your future might be like, loss of health, loss of what you think should have happened in your past and it didn't, you know? So it's so massive, it's so big. And my belief now is that every single human being on this planet is grieving something. Yeah. They just don't realize it's called grief. And and that's really helpful, I think, to label it because I've, and, and to normalize, again, normalize the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can relate so much with my experience when I left my corporate career after 20 years. Um, and I, I specifically remember a colleague um, uh, describing his divorce and um, the pain he felt and the grief that he went through. And I'm like, I'm leaving a job Yes, it was because of an individual who was a bully, um, but it was almost like all the stages that he's described in terms of going through divorce, I could relate to. It's almost like I was going through a work divorce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you were just talking about the culture shock of moving from London to the Cotswolds, I mean, I had my same culture shock when I moved from Cape Town to London, mm -hmm. um, kind of the opposite to you, <laughs> um, in the sense that Cape Town is tiny compared to London and, you know, slower and so much more relaxed and laid back and, and really the countryside where I came from and I always talk about my five-year roller coaster ride because moving to London um, and then you know 
was was only ever going to be here for two years and then two years became three years and so forth you know 20 years later still still in London but in those five early early years uh, the initial five years I had my, my two boys I got married uh, honey and I got married so um, you know and, and, and you're nav navigating a career because I've always been very career driven so every time you have those life events so having a child even though I you know I, I didn't at the time think it was going to change me mm. and naively it did it completely changes your identity so even all those little moments those life events you can almost say that you are grieving your old life to make to make room for your new life and your new identity exactly and the thing is even with having a child and getting married I say this in the new book planet grief you can even grieve in the good times Yes. You would never think grief is related to a good experience, right? You always link it to a negative or a bad experience or something you're, you've lost. But if you think about it logically, when we get married, for example, we're walking down the aisle this way towards our husband and that's a really lovely thing or our wife or whatever we're doing. But you're also walking away from some aspect of your identity, maybe your name, if you choose to give your name up, you're walking away from some aspect of freedom, you know, because you're deciding to get into a, a, a kind of co-relationship. So there are lots of things you can't do anymore because you've signed away those rights, you know. So that's also part of a grieving process, but we don't really link that to grief. And again, becoming a parent, um, I felt this deeply and I realised later, much later that I was grieving having children because I thought, well, hang on, this... This thing that's happened to me, I've got pregnant, I've had a baby and then got pregnant and had a baby again very soon later because my boys are only 15 months apart. Mm. So I had um, I had two under two and so that was quite, <laughs> quite intense. Uh, but very quickly, I changed from being a, a media lovey darling to mum of two and I was like, who is this person now? Mm. You know, I had to kind of swap my high heels for a double buggy, you know, and it was like, no, I don't <laughs> want to do this. And then I felt I was grieving this old person, but I didn't want to let go of her. I wasn't ready. Hmm. Um, and, you know, that was really difficult. And, and, uh, and I think you sort of hit the nail on the head. I think what makes, what makes it so hard and why some people get, stuck and they stay stuck for so long is because we fight it mm -hmm. and we resist it and we, we, we can't seem to let go um, so I want to sort of transition as transition us into a little bit of what, what what are some of the things that you've done in your life to overcome this and to now live your best life to roar you you said so beautifully in the book that you gifted me so this is a copy of of Dipti's book good grief and as as we said the the new book planet grief will be out very very soon october 21 um i have pre-ordered my copy so i can't wait for it um but but you say in your in your letter to me um at the front you say we can turn our grief into our roar <laughs> so we sort of brought our two worlds together so I mean I have my blueprint I have my solution for how I've overcome adversity w what is yours it's a good question and I think maybe it's more of a journey my personal one was a journey yes. so it, it's not like I suddenly went ping great it's not. of course I've... not we, none what? of us none of us do <laughs> you know, uh, okay, I'm grieving. That means I'm strong. Tick. <laughs> Doesn't work like that, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so it, it's a very um, interesting journey. And I, I feel that it's really important to discuss the journey with all of its shadow and light at the same time. So it's, it's not easy. It's not simple, um, but it's very powerful if you know how to negotiate it and navigate it. So 
it's almost as if sometimes you don't realize you're in the journey at all and so you don't feel prepared and things come at you by surprise um but the point of my book is what if we don't um wait until something terrible happens to us because unfortunately you know probably something bad will happen or negative will happen or something will get taken away or somebody will die or mm. you know this sort of stuff happens to everybody in life mm. so if we don't wait until that happens to then work it out what if we can prepare ourselves beforehand mm. but unfortunately human nature doesn't work like that quite often we are so happy to just skip along and carry on until something happens and then negotiate it. So it's not often easy to suggest somebody come in their discomfort zone out of out of their comfort zone, you know, voluntarily. You know, usually people get pushed into the discomfort zone. Yes. yes. Um, without their volition. So I guess in my world what I'm trying to do is to help people understand that the discomfort zone isn't that dangerous or that bad if you know how to meet it before you get there when something happens mm. so i love it, i love what you say about the discomfort zone there's a there's a very sort of usual saying we always say get comfortable with being uncomfortable and it's that whole premise of if you don't feel comfortable let's let's face it you're in a comfort zone you are you are not really growing and so it's it's good to have that sense of discomfort and and it's 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 gently pushing people into the discomfort zone um and inviting let's let's say rather inviting them into the discomfort zone and i think for me personally that that sort of what that looked like was for me to really look inside me um, I never usually did that I was always so outward looking and I cared so much about what other people think about me but suddenly I started going inwards and I started doing the inner inner searching and 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 that was really uncomfortable because then I realized I didn't like myself very much um, and I've always blocked it out and then I had to start really unpicking that um, and that journey so I think that's that for me is also what's um, indicative of your work um, around the hypnotherapy and really really um, you know going inside um, dropping in <laughs> as I call it and getting really still and and we're also addicted to being busy you know I think this is the addiction of our modern life is you know mm -hmm. we keep ourselves so busy all the time um, but what what if we just take that that time in the day for ourselves just to drop in and to really connect with with our higher selves and also yes turning learning to turn the discomfort into power yes yes um but it's such it's such an antithesis of human nature to volunteer to be uncomfortable um you know unless you're some kind of masochist you know like people who love pain you know they will they will go find pain right but usually it's the other way around where people avoid pain, distract themselves away from pain, run away from pain, hide from pain, pretend pain isn't around, yeah. right? There's a really interesting hypnobirthing technique because clearly with birthing, there is pain, you know? And as a hypnobirther, I really can't tell my ladies who are who are going to give birth that, you know, don't worry, there's not going to be any pain. You're just like, sneeze pop the baby out and it will be beautiful you know I really can't say that to them because that's really not likely to happen so what I have to really help them do is be okay with pain mm. to reframe the word pain and turn it into some kind of gain I know that's a cliche but figuring out how to be okay with pain how to expect it and then how to work with it and through it and use it to turn it into a powerful productive resource that it is 
if we can do that with pain, we can do that with fear, we can do that with anxiety, and we can do that with anger. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what I'm doing with grief. I'm helping people turn grief into fuel, you know, turn pain into power. I love that. And and that concept of personal power is essential to my role framework as well, as you know. So it's living your life on purpose, Mm -hmm. in your power, and with the courage to speak your truth. So that power zone that we're describing here is really your your mind, your body, your soul, and your spirit. It's everything, you know, um, thoughts, feelings, beliefs, words, actions, and, and, and how do you almost like train and strengthen that resilience, those resilience muscles to, to turn those into your superpowers, um, as, as you suggest, absolutely beautiful. Um, I, um, I'm such a big fan of this concept of life happens for you or happens for us, it happens to us. And, and you know, what if, um, and I've actually written it down here, I look at it every day, but what if pain and problems were gifts? Um, and, you know, Dipti, I, I'm kind of, you know, going to sort of wrap us up now because um, we can we can talk about this all day, and unfortunately, we've sort of um, run out of time. Um, but I just I can listen to you all day, and um, just absolutely love 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 having this conversation. Um, where can people find you if they want to know more and want to perhaps book a hypnotherapy session with you? Um, it's really easy. It's just my website, which is my name. So it's diptytate.com. Um, everything you need is there. So, and, and I would say, guys, um, Dipti's got lots of free resources on her website as well. So so check it out. It's fantastic. And it's what I love about it as well as it brings, it brings an element of fun. Um, so it, it really puts a smile on your face. And I think that's also what, what for me is so unique about you, uh, Dipti, and what I love about you is that you bring that sense of joy, that sense of vibrancy um, to everything you do. And you're just so authentically yourself. I absolutely love that. Thank you. Yes, I am a fun therapist, which is a <laughs> strange thing to say. <laughs> I think we need that. We need more fun in our lives and we we need to find the joy in the moment, in the present moment. I think that's so, so important. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for for listening and watching. (laughs) Um, It was really a fantastic conversation, Ditti, and I really look forward to um, continuing the conversation with you. And I really look forward to reading your new book as well. So people, please pre-book Ditti's new book, uh, Planet Grief. Uh, You can pre-book it on Amazon now. It's um, out on in in October 21. So keep, keep an eye out for it. Thank you so much for watching. Take care now. Bye.